everyone, uh, welcome to yet another segment of uh, a CIPC podcast. Um, as confirmed in our previous segment, uh, this is just another effort by the CIPC to try and make certain that they do inform the public around some of its products and services and processes that companies are required to comply with with the CIPC and obviously making it, watering it down to, to better your understanding. Um, as we did uh, start with uh, the, the subject of beneficial ownership in our previous segment, um, we will be continuing now also with beneficial ownership, but more on uh, the compliance side of things. So today we are joined uh, by Lucinda Stienkamp, uh, who is uh, our senior legal advisor in our corporate legal division. Uh, good day, Lucinda. Good morning, Fancy. How are you doing? You good? I'm doing good, thank you. Nervous. No, lovely, lovely. <laughs> um, sorry? You're nervous? No, don't be. Don't yes. be. Our, our, our viewers are, are very kind. You don't have to worry much about that. <laughs> you don't have to worry much about that. Now, Lucinda, um, just, just to start off the conversation, um, we obviously covered already the understanding what is beneficial ownership and so forth. Mm -hmm. Maybe just as a precursor to, to our conversation, uh, which companies uh, must file uh, beneficial ownership information with the CIPC? Thanks, Fancy. So, uh, beneficial ownership needs to be filed by all companies, um, closed corporations and external companies. So, um, that would be all corporate vehicles registered with the CIPC that have beneficial ownership to declare. They must submit that information to the Commission. All right. And by when should they file this information? And we do know that there is an annual submission companies do make uh, with the CIPC, which is called the annual return, which we appeal to all business owners uh, and all types of company uh, owners with the CIPC to file their annual returns, obviously, uh, on a yearly basis. But what is the correlation between annual returns and also when a company should file their BO information? Um, the, the General Laws Amendment Act that was promulgated in December of 2022 amended several pieces of legislation, one of them being the Companies Act. And in uh, those amendments, it was indicated that companies must file with their annual return, uh, their securities register, as well as beneficial interest register, if it's applicable, and beneficial ownership information, within 30 business days from its anniversary date. So that would be the date that the company was incorporated or domesticated as a foreign company um, mm. in South Africa. So we correlated, the, the le legislation correlates the dates of the annual return filing with the requirement to do beneficial ownership filing to simplify the process. So once you do that annual return process, you do the BO filing once off mm. everything is done. And I, and, I, and I think the fact that you, you clarified it there, that it's uh, based on the anniversary month. Now, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding to financial year end, which we, we all know it's not really correct. So anniversary month, just to reiterate, would be the, the month the company was registered or domesticated if it was an external company. 100%. No, lovely. Now... With, with these filings, uh, we do know that as much as an, as an organization, we, we prefer company owners and directors filing information uh, themselves with the CIPC. Um, one, to push understanding of what is required of them as, as directors and owners of businesses. Um, and two, to avoid any misinformation between what is filed to us as the CIPC and obviously the information of the company. So. Regarding BO, who should file the BO information on behalf of the company? Can a third, a third party file it on, on their behalf or do we do we also expect them to be the ones that uh, take the, the responsibility of making that filing? 
Well, Ofensi, um, the CIPC is cognizant of the fact that many companies use uh, secretarial firms, accountants, uh, lawyers to submit certain administrative requirements or filings with the CIPC, including mm. annual returns, director changes, name changes, mm. etc. Um, in line of that, we mm. uh, decided in terms of our internal BO register that they can provide a mandate to a third party. So the company can provide a mandate to a secretarial company, for example, to submit their beneficial ownership information to mm. the commission. Uh, there is very strict requirements for this mandate. Mm. So, uh, for example, it must be to a natural person. Uh, company ABC Shoes cannot provide a mandate to company XYZ to submit their BO. It must be to mm. a natural person um, with that filer's uh, information, name, ID number, etc., because of the val internal validations that the CIPC do against the Department of Home Affairs and others mm. to ensure that the filings are legitimate. And uh, the mm. mandate as well needs to be signed by 50% plus one of directors in the case of a company. In the case of close corporations, the mandate must be signed by all of the members of the CC to ensure that that person filing on behalf of an entity has mm. the requisite permissions to do the filing because it is a criminal offense if you submit false or misleading information to the commission. Mm. And um, also to ensure that uh, that they have all the information at hand to proceed with the beneficial ownership filing. Oh, that's lovely. Now, maybe just to, to take it even on, on that mandate, uh, no, because uh, a lot of entities seem to also be confused with uh, the reason why there is a mandate. And I think you touched a bit of it uh, now. Um, but also for companies where you find that it's a group, for example, and they want to issue one mandate for all of the entities in the group and so forth, would such be permitted? Or as you stated, it is required that 50 plus one of directorship or 50 plus one of membership, if it's a CC, would be required to sign on, on, on that mandate, giving mandate to whoever to file on their behalf. So can a collective mandate be, be concluded for, for BO filing? Um, absolutely. Thank you for that question. We do not want group mandates to be issued because every declaring company needs to make take responsibility for the information that is being filed through the filer for whom a mandate is provided. So um, we've seen in the past, for example, you will get a general uh, power of attorney or a general mandate stating that a person can file all amendments for this company, um, which mm. can include director amendments, name changes, MOI amendments, etc. That's something mm. that we do not accept in terms of the BO register because of the sensitivity of the information that's being filed. So when we receive that BO filing, we accept that the information being filed is true and correct mm. and that the filer confirms, it's also indicated on the register, that they have a mandate to file on behalf of this declaring company mm. and that the information they are submitting is true and correct in terms of what the entity provided to them. So um, each company within a group still has a responsibility to declare their beneficial ownership independently um, so we require that mm. independent mandate to be issued per entity. Oh, lovely, lovely. Thanks for that clarity, because I think uh, a, a lot of entities look at the administrative filing mandates and they try to group them the same way they would have grouped that and try to use that for, for beneficial ownership. Now, uh, a mandate is just part one of the supporting documentations that are required when filing uh, PO information. Uh, we also do know that there is other supporting documents that would be required. Now, could you just maybe share some light? The difference between a share register, a security register, and a beneficial interest register. Um, to a layman, they might believe that they all speak the same thing because we're speaking about ownership. Um, but could you just maybe clarify to, to us and, and to obviously to our viewers, the difference between a share register, security register, and a beneficial interest register. 
Um, absolutely. Thanks, Fancy. We get this question a lot. Um, we are all uh, used to talking about a share register. Uh, the, however, a share register, securities register, essentially the same thing. However, securities refer to uh, other um, financial documents, which can be debenture holders, that type of thing as well. So that's why the legislation was amended to refer to securities register, not just shares. Um, the, the difference between a securities register and a beneficial interest register is that a securities register refers to um, the holder of the securities within a specific entity. It's always easier for me to explain through an example. Um, say, for example, ABC Shoes has their securities register. Lucinda Steenkamp is 80% shareholder within that entity. Um, mm. My information will be indicated mm. in the securities register for ABC Shoes with uh, the 80% shareholding, my name, ID number, um, contact information and address. That information must be in the securities register. It's legislatively required. Now, the difference with a beneficial interest register using the same example is where a person holds the securities on behalf of someone else. So um, in ABC Shoes, Lucinda Steenkamp is 80% shareholder. It's registered. I'm a known shareholder. That information is in the securities register. But 20% of those shares, that 80%, I hold mm. on behalf of Offensi. Mm. So Offensi's information is not indicated in the securities register, but is a beneficial interest holder in this entity because I hold 20% of the mm. shares on behalf of Offensi, which makes you a beneficial interest holder. And that mm. information must be indicated in the beneficial interest register. Mm. So you let me know when that 20% is paying, because if you're holding 20% <laughs> on my behalf, uh, I, have to I expect find to be receiving my <laughs> dividend uh, very soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and, and maybe on, the, on, on, on that note, uh, you, you clarified it quite well between the interest holder and uh, the beneficial owner, because um, through a lot of our social media platforms and, in, and, and inquiries we receive, um there's a confusion between is a shareholder or a beneficial owner or is a beneficial owner a shareholder and what the difference is and i think you've covered that very well now in this explanation that you would have given now to say how do we then demystify between uh a security register as well as a beneficial interest uh register now the the simple nitty-gritties of of filing what information is required uh when filing bio information obviously as far as supporting documents we've already covered that there is a mandate obviously that's required uh you've clarified as to how it must be constituted with the signatures of directors or members of a close corporation but what other information uh is required to be filed or given in in this bo information so in if in terms of um entities that have beneficial ownership um, that is separate from the securities register and the beneficial interest register because, as we know, beneficial ownership is very wide and it mm. includes control where there isn't specific ownership percentage attached to it. Mm. So um, for beneficial owners, we uh, require full name, surname, ID number, date of birth, passport number if it's foreigners, a residential and postal address, contact information, which is very important, mobile uh, email, and then the percentage of ownership mm. or control. So the, the BO register um, is very user-friendly, I, I think, in terms of providing that information, where you, for example, have a trust that is a shareholder in a declaring company, uh, we know beneficial owner can only be a natural person. So now we need to look at that trust, which is a heuristic person. And we drill down to the trustees and the beneficiaries in terms of that trust, who are the beneficial owners inherently holding the shareholding of the company. And that information mm. needs to be declared. Lovely. Um, when it comes to 
the filing, as you said, it, help, it happens online. So it's, it's a pretty simple process because it does guide you, obviously, as to information required then. How do you upload uh, certain information or upload the, the supporting documents that would be physical documents that they would have scanned? Now, does it ever happen that a, a company files BO information and CIPC in them uh, going about the duty they happen to reject or discard or, or send back an application or information filed by, by, by a BO or a declaring uh, entity. In most cases, what is the reason behind CIPC discarding if they do ever discard a BO application? So um, very important question to clarify between discarding and rejecting. So. Mm -hmm. Um, our BO register functionality provides for uh, filers to get onto the register, submit certain information. Now they're halfway there um, and they see that I, I am missing the ID number of a beneficial owner. Or I don't have all the supporting documents or whatever the case may be. The system allows them to file the, uh, to save the information already in the, entered into the register log out, come back again when they do have the requisite information and complete the filing. However, what happened is that uh, many of these draft or pending applications aren't finalized and finalists mm. start the process anew. And this distorts the CIPC data in terms of the uh, number of filings that we've received of declaring companies. So what we have done is we have uh, allowed for the development of discarding these pending and um, draft filings every 30 days. So if a client came in to the register, did the information, saved it, but they never came back to complete, the system will run a check every 30 days um, to see if there are mm. any drafts or pending filings and mm. discard those from the system. So on the front end, what the clients will see is that those drafts and pending are gone. The CIPC still keep record of these. Um, this will form part of our records mm. as well as uh, analysis of the BO register once we start doing that as well. But uh, this mm. gives a, us a clearer picture of the completed beneficial ownership filings because a saved or pending mm. filing is not done and it cannot be um, seen as a completed filing. And that's why we are deleting those in order to give a better picture of our BO filing process. On the other hand, in terms of um, refiling, the, the CIPC is in the process of finalizing the development of our functionality to examine these filings. And should there be issues, uh, ID number is not, or the uh, certified ID copy is not submitted, or there's a problem with the mandate, CIPC will reject that filing with reasons mm -hmm. for rejection and provide the companies with an opportunity to correct whatever is uh, it was rejected for, incomplete, incorrect, whatever the case may be. So that would mm. be a refiling, and, and we don't discard any submissions. It's just um, examining them for correctness and completeness. All right. So basically, uh, in a nutshell, it is very important that when they do file, they file complete information as and every time that they do de de declare um, in this information. Absolutely. They need All to right. get that. They need to get that. Uh, if they have BOs to declare, mm. they need to get that confirmation certificate at the end of the line showing that it was a completed filing. Or in mm. the case of no beneficial owners or affected companies, they mm. will only receive a notification, which is also an indication of a completed filing. All right. Listen, let's see. Uh, thank you very much for for your time. Uh, I know you're quite busy, so we do take we do appreciate the time that you would have taken from your schedule to obviously be part of the podcast and obviously help in educating our customers a bit more. Uh, as always, I would uh, allow you a, a, a parting shot, Lucinda. Uh, what message? What is it that you would like to to spread out there? What is it that you would feel that you want to get off your chest and 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 give to our viewers as a parting shot? Uh, from you. 
Thanks very much, uh, Fancy, and thank you for this opportunity. I think it is very important to communicate to our clients as much as possible and provide as much information as possible. Um, as a parting shot, um, I would refer all our clients to access the Beneficial Ownership User Guide published on the CIPC website, which gives you clear details on how the register works, what information needs to be submitted, what we do with that information, and to guide you step by step on um, fulfilling your compliance responsibilities in terms of beneficial ownership declaration. Thanks, Fancy. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. Um, and do continue with the great work that you're doing. Now, thank you for this segment, guys, for uh, allowing us the opportunity to obviously go further in, in, in making certain that we do demystify some of uh, the processes and information that is required by you or from you by, by the CIPC. Um, as we did state in, in previous segments, this is just another effort by the CIPC to make certain that we do bridge the gap between us as an organization and, and customers that transact on our site, business owners, obviously, that transacted in, in this economy of, of ours. Um, so till next time, uh, we say it's your business and it's our focus. So continue doing business and you. Uh, from a from the CIPC, thank you very much. Till next time.